Good morning and good evening. I am Kathy Tai from Center for International Private Enterprise. Welcome to today's event, Turning Corrosive Capital into Constructive Capital. This event is the first in a series of five bi-weekly discussions on the findings of the BRI Monitor project. The BRI Monitor is a regional initiative that seeks to advocate for greater transparency and accountability by identifying governance gaps associated with Chinese funded projects in Southeast Asia. Each meeting will highlight findings from one of the project partners as part of a discussion on transparency and governance with experts on the focus country or project type. The five partners on the BRI monitor projects are Ideas of Malaysia, Stratbase ADRI in the Philippines, the Institute of National Affairs in Papua New Guinea, Future Forum of Cambodia, and Sandy Governance Institute, who are here with us today. The BRI monitor includes descriptive case studies and a transparency heat map that assesses the transparency of BRI projects based on 38 data points that should be proactively disclosed by host countries according to international best practices. It is our great privilege to work with think tank partners on such a unique project. While there has been widespread discussions about how to counter the Bail and Road Initiative, our partners are not seeking to stop investments. Rather, our focus is on mitigating governance risks to avoid the corrosive potential of opaque investments. Here at SITE, in partnerships with local think tanks, we have been developing strategies to neutralize the negative impact of corrosive capital. We define corrosive capital as financing, where whether it's from state or private, that lacks transparency, accountability, and market orientation. Typically originating from authoritarian regimes, corrosive capital exploits and exaggerates governance gaps to influence economic, political, and social developments in recipient countries. Saiba and its partners have been working to one, map out the investment landscape and the economic footprint of corrosive capital, and two, to identify governance gaps that have been exploited and widened by corrosive capital. The BRI monitor is the next step. It's a tool to encourage greater transparency and accountability to ensure that investment on constructive, not corrosive. The country of focus today is Burma, Myanmar a country that I first visited about 10 years ago. Witnessing the transformation and also a series of reforms that a country was undertaking, that experience itself was just exhilarating. However, the military coup that took place earlier this year and the subsequent arrest and imprisonment of pro-democracy voices is heart-wrenching. China has been trying to maintain a very favorable position among political elites, irrespective of who is in power. Chinese investments have been important to Myanmar when other foreign investments have been hesitant to move in. Chinese sources of funding have grown only in importance as Western investments dried up after the coup. Today, we're happy to have four distinguished panelists to share their observations and research findings with us. First is Kaiwen and Nilar, who are from the Sandy Governance Institute. Kaiwen is the founder and executive director, and Nilar is the research director of SGI. Kaiwen has special interest on the public-private partnerships, PPP. He has authored a number of PPP monitoring reports to identify high risk areas in three in these five projects, ranging from New Yangon City project to the Medina Economic Zone project in uh, the Kachin State. Nilar's focus is on public procurement reform and is the lead researcher for the BRI monitor project. 
She's responsible for the transparency heat map and is the primary author of the BRI case studies. And we have Jason, Jason Tower, who is the country director for the Burma program of USIP. He was in China for a long time working on programs to examine the impacts of cross-border investments on conflict dynamics. Since 2019, his research has focused on the impact of BRI on conflicts. Last but not least, we have Lucas, Lucas Chang, a Yangon-based lawyer. His practice covers a broad spectrum of foreign direct investments, mergers and acquisitions, corporate law, sanctions, and tax. First, we will have each panelist to share their first-hand observations and analysis uh, with us, and each panelist will have seven minutes uh, for their remarks. And after that, I will moderate the Q&A session. Then we will open the floor up for all the audience to ask questions. So for our initial remarks, we will start with uh, Kai Wen. Wu Kai Wen, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very much honored to be here with you, with you all. Good morning in, in Washington and good evening, good evening in Bangkok, Bangkok. Let me uh, share my power of why. Okay. So I, I, I will not dwell on, on it for a long time, but I, I want to use it. Actually, uh, first of all, I want to explain to, 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 to the attendee about the economic, recent economic situation in our, in our country. Because I think that uh, the current economic situation in Myanmar also is related to investment, huh? both both BRI and other other foreign direct investment. Actually, uh, the the economic situation downturn is very severe, and then even even the ADB recently uh, updated its uh, focus on on our country from nine percent to eighteen point four minus. 18.4 percent contraction. It, I think it, it's it's a very huge loss for for our country. Similarly, UNDP also estimated that poverty would double in the beginning of 2022. So poverty in our country, nearly half of the population will be will be will be will be below the below the poverty line. So it's very huge number of households. They will, they, they, they will find the situation very, very difficult. Also, um, unemployment rate will also rise, according to ILO report, and so nearly 1.2 million unemployed, maybe more than that, because most of the workers in our country, they are working in informal sector. So, and then, because uh, these economic downturn, was caused by political shock. A political shock. Well, we have to we have to attribute the downturn. We can attribute the downturn to SAC coup. The coup is a main culprit for the for the for the economic uh, eco economic recession. So now, following the, the actual banking cri after the coup, banking crisis, COVID nineteen third wave, and current currencies crisis really really weaken our our eco economy. And then actually SAC strategy for economic recovery. And in my opinion, they are also preparing for the, for the long game. They are aware of the depth of the economic downturn. That's why they, 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 are, they, they are initiating impulse substitution in line with the declining foreign currency revenue. And then they are, they are promoting self-sufficiency, protectionism, and at the same time, um, my my point number four is they are also extending undue incentive to to do mainly Chinese investors to attract foreign direct investment because of, <coughs> because of the, the current SAC chairman senior general May online became the chairman of the BRI steering committee uh, replacing the San Suji and then uh, actually they are also they have also removed one clause from the from the BRA working committee. That clause 
is very important for, for any investment project. That's a public consultation. But they said that they, 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 were, they, they removed the public consultation. That means that Chinese investment or any other invest, investment in coming without being scrutinized thoroughly by the, by the, by the communities. Mm -hmm. So they are, it seems that they are also sending signal to the Chinese that if you come in, we will approve it. And they, they have also approved mega project in May, in May 2021, including LNG to power, million giant, million giant LNG to power project. It's a very huge pro mega project, $2.5 billion project, LNG to power project. So I think that they are, that they, this, this is their uh, impose substitution the the SAC chief, Honda chief, senior general may on may online, he is visiting or uh, visiting actually the closed down factories, steel factory. That steel factory is in Shan, Shan State, Shan State, and actually it, it, it was uh, it was a joint venture cooperation, uh, cooperation between Myanmar Economic Co 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 Corporation. The military, you know, military affiliated state owned enterprise, and then Rush, Russian investment. But uh, it, it was not successful. But now the, the, the military is trying to re, reopen this factory. And at the same time, it says sufficiency on, the, on daily basic, SAC <laughs> chief, chief or his commanders are visiting pig and poultry farms. So they are promoting uh, agriculture and, and, and life, livestock sector. They are saying that we are, we are self-sufficient. That means that they, they have political agenda. They are preparing for the, for the long game. So, but neither SAC has monetary nor fiscal ammunition to resolve current economic woes. The massive international assistance needed to address current crises and for, for economic recovery that's uh, I was I have also written articles, and then I have pointed out that they, they cannot no, they they cannot make the economy recover from the from the deep recession. But it seems that you know, they will not they will not make compromise with with the opposition movement, as well as uh, any any international negotiator. So they were they were they, that's why they, they are preparing for they 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 are preparing for 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 the long game and to withstand uh, economic session, sanctions. Uh, what will begin of economy? That thing that the now fuel prices are going up. And then the, 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 the agricultural sector, actually during the, uh, during the COVID-19, no, 19 first wave and second wave, economic, agricultural sector was unaffected. It was resilient, but because of the uh, coup and Banking, banking crisis, uh, payment, payment transaction, transactions cannot, cannot conduct easily. That's why fertilizer prices also go up. And then according to this International Food Policy Research Institute's working paper, the, the fertilizer imports decline nearly half, 50. And then, and then the, the sales also de decline and then farmers Smallholder farm, uh, farm, farmers, they cannot, they cannot buy, they cannot purchase sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, fertilizer. That's why the, the agricultural output in in October, after after monsoon uh, monsoon season, will decline significantly. That will have a major impact on the poverty because eighty percent of the people in our country, they are linked to agricultural sector. So. Economic situation is very, very, uh, very, very uh, bad, and th that's why very important. And then uh, I want to, or secondly, I want to explain to you uh, about the BRI, you know, some some features of a BRI. So, in our country, uh, as Brad Box from ADA has mentioned in his in his paper, that the two feet, the two feature. The, the political capture and corruption. But in my opinion, corruption is more prominent in our, in our country, BRI, BRI and Chinese investment project than polit political capture. 
usually the, the uh, usually local authorities and and high ranking authorities they 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 are involved in corruption scandal especially in land acquisition uh, land grabbing uh, most, most of the land in our country are not registered so because uh, the, the farmers they are most of them are uneducated rural, rural people are very simple they they don't know how to how to uh, register their their land taking advantage of this when when the huge mega project come in usually lo local authorities and and uh, military military commanders they confiscated they confiscated land from the from, from the from the community that is you know, that is happening that was happening in the past and that is uh that can also happen in in the future too now that feature 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 of corruption is prominent in 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 our country chinese investment and prm prm project so with respect to governance gaps governance gaps so corruption corruption and transparency and access to public information the project information it's very difficult even in nld's time we cannot you know, have access to important uh, important data related to the related to project uh, bri or any other project but for example new yango city project they 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 boasted that that project would be implemented you know, very very transparently but actually the we cannot have access to to project proposal or uh, feasibility study that's a major challenge major governance gaps in in our country without having transparency we cannot hold the people accountable but uh actually uh chinese investment and and china's government they have they have adapted uh, adapted after after 2010 to address some governance issues they they are also engaging with civil society and launching political uh, uh public relation camp no public relation campaign but not sufficient or people uh, people at the community level or civil society people from civil society like us we don't have uh, sufficient information to scrutinize and to screen on these uh, investment projects these are the major governance gaps for now so i will stop here and then I, I thank will... you Thank you so much, uh, Ukaiwan, uh, for giving the introduction of uh, the economic uh, challenges after the coup and also identify some major governance gaps of the country. And now we're turning this uh, to uh, uh, Nilar. We cannot hear it. Uh, unmuted. We can't hear anything. I'm muted now. Ninglawa, everyone. I want to, I just want to give political update of the, how to call it, a current situation of the, of the case studies areas, because uh, I think that it is also useful for you to understand how things are going on after military coup. So that uh, actually, first of all, I want to introduce you the BRI monitor cases we studied in uh, for this project. The, uh, the first one we did, uh, we study is a Chaochu Special Economic Zone uh, project. Actually, uh, you know that it is in Rakhine State. And then another uh, two, uh, projects are the sector of extractive industry, liberal copper mine projects located in Sakai region in middle Burma, and then oil and gas pipeline project. It is also in Chaochu area. And then the last one we are now writing a case study is on Musa Mandalay railway project. And so these four projects we study for this uh, BRI monitor project. So the, the first one, I want to give update about the, the situation. So that uh, 
in Myanmar that you will think that uh, the situation uh, can be the same because uh, now in every way you will see that a political time wide, but uh, comparatively, Rakhine State looks uh, a bit, uh, how to call it, uh, stable, politically stable. And then also uh, the, uh, they started to, uh, actually in Myanmar, that it, uh, the, the such interesting thing is that this Western part of the country, if you are familiar with Rohingya crisis or something like that, in that area that uh, nowadays that uh, compared to uh, previous, uh, before 2020, the situation changed a bit. And then also uh, people, uh, according to uh, our civil society partners that ar around at least one third and then more than one third of the population supported AA, Arakan Army, and then also they have political wing, wing United League of Arakan. And so nowadays that they said that they have parallel, parallel administrative system. And then also uh, a, lot, a lot of rural people, are, how to call it, uh, relying on uh, ULA administration. However, the challenge is for civil society groups is that uh, in the government control area that Nowadays, uh, Arakan Army is no longer uh, in the blacklist of the, the SAC. It means that uh, they are no longer a lawful association. But in Myanmar, that if you are familiar with uh, Myanmar law, that uh, we are still using a lawful association act. And so that if the, if the SAC wants to make problem to civil society groups and people, uh, in their in uh, other uh, how to call it in government control areas, they still arrested uh, people, and then a lot of people are still in prison uh, because of uh, with and uh, they arrested with a uh, charge with unlawful association. And then also interestingly, the Chukchu Special Economic Zone project. Uh, we have to say they're at least moving on because uh, they reformed new management committee uh, led by vice chairman of the S SAC. And then also uh, in June, SA, uh, special, special, special economic so central committee meeting was organized. And then also, uh, how to call it, Myanmar uh, uh, special economic so holding consortium public uh, committee limited was also uh, formed with 40, uh, 42 uh, uh, local companies. And then also they invited uh, local and foreign company, companies for expression of interest for legal services. And so that in, uh, in some way that we have to, uh, how to call it, assume that job uh, to as uh, a project is moving on because uh, CITIC, uh, how to call it, CITIC's uh, members are also uh, in, involved in new management committee. And the second one is Lebedown Copal Mine. Lebedown Copal Mine is located in Middle Parma, and then you will see the, how do you call it, the area. And so that area nowadays has a lot of uh, clashes. And then the uh, Chin State, Kachin State, they are also have a, a, a lot of fighting. And so uh, Leveron Cobalt Mine areas that uh, recently they even attacked water pipeline, but uh, the, the, how to call it, uh, we did not get any uh, information from both one pound, one pound uh, company, this is our, which is running Leveron Cobalt Mine project. And then also uh, from the SAC side, they did not report anything. And so that it means that uh, it did not uh, affect much for, uh, for uh, the copper mine project. But it, it, around that area, a lot of fightings are going on. And then the third one uh, we did is, uh, this is what I want to show about uh, the Lebanon copper mine areas and then fightings and clashes. It is, uh, the map is from uh, Ministry of uh, uh, NUG government. And so that uh, th this is the update from 5th October. And then the third one, we are, how do you call it? We did, uh, we study is Chowchu oil and gas pipeline projects. And then as you will see that 
uh, although we mentioned that uh, job to special, how do you call it, uh, special economy zone uh, project looks stable because of the, the situation in Chaochu. But for Chaochu, while and gas pipelines, they have to cross a lot of conflict affected area nowadays. And then also in, in Northern Shan State, there are so many, how do you call it, uh, clashes going on. And then also in Zagai uh, region. And so that uh, this oil and gas pipeline, uh, sometimes that people uh, started to say something about uh, to attack or some, uh, so that it is a kind of worrisome situation. And then number four, uh, the project we are currently studying is Muslim Mandalay Railway Project. It just only finished feasibility study. And then during, uh, 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 during NLD time, that they, uh, they plan to start, start. And then also from Mandalay to Chaochu also, they started a new, how to call it, feasibility study project. But uh, after, after a coup, military coup, that uh, when I talked to civil society groups in Northern Shan State, they showed much concern about land confiscation because the simple reason is that uh, in the past uh, 10, uh, in the, in, uh, during military rule that they never got, uh, how to call it, a proper compensation. And then also at the same time, a lot of people in that area, they became uh, displaced in that area. Uh, that's why that uh, they, uh, especially around Dampaka, uh, in, uh, I don't know, Shoot. around that area that people show much concern about uh, land confiscation. And then also they are worried that, uh, they, they even said the word like, they are praying for not, uh, how to call it, uh, for not doing anything. But uh, also fightings are going on in that area. And then the, finally, what I want to highlight is that uh, for this political situation that people would think that it is NLD and the SHC, actually in reality, this is people's revolution because uh, people are uh, really uh, for so long that uh, people in Myanmar have to suffer uh, the, how to call it, uh, the system which uh, combined uh, the power and the, and uh, you call it, uh, power and the wealth, they are together. And then we are oppressed with uh, using power and then also cronyism and all these, how to call it, bully things that we have, uh, it happened uh, in the uh, and the military rule. And so that, uh, and then also at the same time, one thing I want to highlight here is about perception and sentiment of the people that uh, to be honest with you, that I don't want to share any of the, how to call it, poster or uh, some of the, in general, that Myanmar people have a kind of sentiment of anti-Chinese sentiment. Together with this, they also feel that uh, their perception is uh, that if uh, for Chinese investment cannot be, how to call it, uh, cannot follow the government, uh, the, the governance guidelines, and then also not transparent. And then like uh, Kai Win mentioned that before, that a lot of, they are very expensive and corruption that they will follow the SAC's, uh, uh, SAC's uh, request to give end up table money, that type of, uh, how to call it, feeling they have. And then also one thing I want to highlight here is that even for civil society organizations in Myanmar nowadays, that we have to be very careful to affiliate with the, the, uh, the SAC. The simple reason is that uh, they, they are, how to call it, if we have a kind of relationship with the SAC, they think that we are pro, uh, pro military. And so with this reason that they, how do, uh, there are so many uh, misunderstanding from the, the people cited. In the beginning that people are so disappointed for, no, uh, uh, for uh, you know that for COVID-19 a situation that in Myanmar also economically it hit hard. 
And then after that, that what happened is that uh, oh, uh, this wine that in uh, 2020, uh, November elections, the people uh, during this uh, second wave of the COVID, a lot of people came out and then voted NLD because they are worried that the military, if a military big party won, that uh, they, they have to encounter the same feeling. But uh, the military, when the, uh, the military uh, coup, uh, coup happened, that at first people were so disappointed uh, for uh, that they were not, they cannot recover from economic hardship. Uh, they expected after the after vaccine and so that uh, they are so disappointed in the beginning and it turned into anger and then they protest like i show here but uh, later at later stage then a lot of people were arrested and then also killed uh, that's the reason people now have a kind of firm resolution that we have to double down all the system and so that it's more like a kind of revolution to uh, for radical change of the whole system so that you can expect that uh, federal type of uh, economy and then also a, the, a totally different type of system we expect it. So uh, for Chinese investment, uh, taking this opportunity, I also want to say that uh, as you know, the perception can be changed. And so uh, taking this uh, crisis as a kind of opportunity, we are neighbors and then also uh, please change an image of Chinese investment in Myanmar. And then we, uh, if you follow the, how to call it, rules and regu uh, regulations, uh, if you follow the rules and regulations of the country, as well as if you are, how to call it, uh, if you show that you are a good neighbor, that, that uh, people will really welcome you because uh, now uh, we are in desperate need of uh, how to call this support from our neighbors. Thank you. This is my how to call it, uh, final <laughs> slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manila. Uh, thank you, especially uh, for pointing out, uh, you know, what the Burmese or people in the Myanmar would like to see on foreign investments, you know, the, the public sentiment of it. I thought that was very valuable. And also, I love all the maps they showed, the location of all the projects, three out of four, they all kind of connected back to China to show the importance for both Myanmar and China. So um, really appreciate uh, the insight. Um, so now next we turn to uh, Jason. Uh, Jason, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Kathy, and thanks to CIP for the invitation to be here uh, this evening. Uh, maybe to start off, um, USIP has been active in Burma since uh, 2012, and a lot of our work, uh, both uh, our research as well as our applied peace building work, focuses on uh, underlying drivers of conflict. So uh, when we look at some of these issues, we're particularly keen on understanding how uh, cross-border investment um, and China being one of the largest investors in Myanmar, how that investment is impacting conflict uh, in the country. And increasingly, we've also been identifying that uh, illicit capital and uh, Chinese transnational criminal actors are also playing a pretty significant role in influencing uh, conflict in Myanmar in different ways. So I'll highlight some of the different points that we look at around um, some of the research that we're doing on how China, uh, through its investments and influence in Myanmar, has impacts on, on conflict issues. Before I do that, though, um, and I think uh, already that uh, Kokain Nguyen and, and Manular have given quite a lot in terms of contextual uh, background about some of the things that have happened uh, since the coup. But I wanted to emphasize maybe just uh, two or three uh, additional points to kind of place things in context a little bit. Um, first of all, and I think what is really critical on, to understand is that the country effectively has become ungovernable since uh, the coup. The junta simply has no legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And we're seeing the situation only get worse as uh, more and more violence, um, de detention, um, random attacks on communities, uh, even air raids and airstrikes are being used against uh, the Myanmar people. Um, uh, within the civil uh, civilian uh, bureaucracy, um, you've seen uh, a mass exit from um, 
the health sector, from the uh, education sector, uh, you're seeing also now increasing defections from uh, police. Um, and so basic public services are also largely no longer available. And of course, I think this along with many of the points that uh, Ko Penwin shared around uh, economy and the economic picture already uh, kind of gives a sense of the type of environment that companies are now uh, having to work in, in, in country. Secondly, um, is that violence uh, continues to escalate. And what you effectively now have uh, is uh, the military waging war against society broadly. Um, there have been over 150 People's Defense Forces that have now been formed. This is essentially just uh, people who are initially peaceful protesters who are starting to take up arms. Um, you're starting to see explosions, uh, targeted killings, assassinations of uh, junta uh, administrators, along with that more defections, of course. But since September 7th, uh, when the National Unity Government uh, declared a people's defensive war, that's essentially the, the scenario you now have between uh, the military and uh, the broader uh, society. And then the third point is that the country really is being torn apart. So while all of this chaos, uh, lack of governance, um, you know, civil war is going on across uh, the country, particularly in the heartland areas, uh, you're seeing in the periphery a lot of the very powerful ethnic armed organizations increasing their control, increasing their influence, uh, expanding uh, in some cases or consolidating uh, territories. And in some other cases, you're seeing them um, demand major concessions from the Tatmadaw in order to not go back to hostilities. And I think that Malila has talked already a little bit about some of the dynamics in Rakhine State. But this, I think, gives you a little bit of a picture of the context that we're now seeing uh, Chinese cross-border investments uh, continue. Uh, and I do say continue because we have seen uh, a number of new Chinese projects as well as uh, continuation of existing projects that has uh, gone on since uh, the coup. Um, so now I'm going to turn a little bit to talk about some of what we're seeing around um, Chinese investments, both on the more licit, illicit side, although I think these things increasingly are getting blurred, um, and I'll try and talk a little bit about that as well. But there's three key points that I'd like to, to touch on. Um, the first of these is that China has very deep interests um, in, uh, in Myanmar. And I'm going to try and uh, just to, to throw up a, a quick uh, uh, visual here um, so that you can get a sense of what some of that looks like. But you'll see that these red lines here um, in this uh, uh, diagram, um, they show the China-Myanmar economic corridor, a good uh, proportion of which is located in China. If you look at the uh, border where it says Rayleigh and Chin Saha, here the um, uh, Yunnan provincial government has created a series of what are known as cross-border economic cooperation zones. Each of these zones has billions of US dollars in investments uh, in industry that's premised upon doing what? Well, uh, premised upon um, Yunnan province having an outlet through uh, Myanmar to the Indian Ocean so that the goods that are produced in those industrial zones can be shipped out to the rest of the world. Uh, there's a zone in an area called Lingtang, which is across from Kokong, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, special autonomous zones up here in the border area, uh, kind of close to where uh, Chin Saha is. This particular zone alone has 31 billion US dollars of investment only on the Chinese side. So that gives you, I think, a little bit of a flavor of the interests. Uh, Yunnan's development model has largely focused on using its special position vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar, on harnessing the Myanmar economy to Yunnan's economy, and on pulling in investment from across China and from really across the world uh, into Yunnan as a major driver, a major engine for Yunnan's growth, but all of this being premised on that connectivity that Myanmar offers. Um, you've seen this also be raised up very much to the level of state-to-state, -state, government to government relations. So in uh, 2020, uh, you saw Xi Jinping make a, a historical visit to Myanmar. 
where a series of high level agreements were signed, really cementing this relationship and uh, pushing for the two countries to move ahead with what China refers to as creating uh, a community of shared destiny between the two countries. Um, uh, along with this, China has a lot of interests in terms of border security, because as you can see from the diagram, those sort of red explosions there in the border area, you have a lot of armed groups right on the border. A lot of these have co-ethnics on the other side, so very much China sees this 2,000 kilometer long border as relating to its national interests and to its um, national uh, security. Um, in addition to that, and the last point I'm going to say on this is uh, you have also an energy corridor that provides China with up to 5% of its oil imports and roughly 7% of its natural gas imports. These again are major growth engines for Yunnan and without these things, getting high levels of sustained growth in Yunnan would be very difficult. So China has a lot at stake uh, in terms of the Myanmar relationship. Now, all of these interests have been subject to, to huge risks as a result of the coup because when you're dealing with this type of violence, when the Myanmar population, as I think um, the earlier speakers have already pointed out, are increasingly seeing China as providing support to the junta, a lot of that frustration and sentiment is targeted not only at the military, but also being targeted at anyone supporting the military. And I think that's why you're seeing increasingly these attacks on some of the strategic Chinese projects, as well as the different textile firms um, and other enterprises that have also um, shown higher levels of risk or been uh, damaged by some of the violence that has happened earlier. Now, a second point that I wanted to touch on is that while you have all of this state investment that's moving ahead, Myanmar is at the same time also a hub for Chinese transnational crime. This activity is happening across the country, but it is um, most present in areas that are under the control of militias, and these are very corrupt militias, I should add, um, that are uh, administratively under the Myanmar army or under the Tatmadaw's uh, uh, control. Uh, border guard forces is what these are known as. There is a Chinese speaking border guard force in Kokong, which hosts uh, uh, multiple um, uh, investment projects that are, are really uh, premised around the idea of facilitating illegal cross-border gambling from China into Myanmar, as well as illegal money transfers and a range of other criminal activities are also, also known to happen up in the Kokong areas, which again, up in the map is where you see Chin Saha right there on, on the border. And then a second one of these is in Karen State down in um, the, the southern part. And I've uh, uh, highlighted that also in the map where you have an entire crime city that was initiated by a um, Chinese fugitive uh, with billions of dollars of investments, but once again, premised on um, facilitating online gambling and providing a space for uh, different types of Chinese transnational criminal networks that are doing online uh, fraud or other types of financial fraud. Um, so what you're seeing happening in terms of, of some of these patterns is that the militia groups that are hosting these projects are becoming increasingly integrated with the Chinese transnational criminal networks. And I think one major threat here from a conflict vantage point is that this creates major incentives for more or less maintaining a status quo. So not really finding any ways to move forward with peace building efforts or efforts that are going to extend responsible governance into these areas but essentially to continue this relationship where the military relies on these militias for support and looks the other way as they're advancing transnational criminal activities. Now, China is trying to crack down on this. It has currently a campaign that's trying to call back uh, tens of thousands of Chinese nationals, particularly in Northern Myanmar, many of whom have been involved in this criminal activity, some of whom have not. But this campaign does not get at any of the key kingpins. And in some of our research, and I'm happy to share some links, we've looked at how some of these kingpins have co-opted effectively the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, co-opted many Chinese 
state actors and enterprises into um, the different sorts of criminal schemes that they're advancing, including these casino cities, uh, as a means of providing legitimacy to themselves, uh, but also as a means of providing protection to um, themselves as, as well. Um, so you're seeing also some of these sorts of trends. And I think in the post-coup environment, also you're going to see a continued rise in criminal activity in Myanmar as uh, these militia groups are going to be needed more and more. And we're seeing this trend already by the, um, uh, uh, the Tabada in order to crack down on the people and crack down on other ethnic armed organizations, which will give them even more of a mandate to continue this uh, criminal activities. Um, the third point, and I think I've already touched on this a little bit, but that's um, really that um, increasingly in the post-coup environment, I think we're going to see uh, further threats of there being more blurs between um, Chinese state capital and initiatives and some of these uh, illicit, illicit capital networks. And the reason that I argue this is uh, first of all, that the state owned enterprises are going to need stability in order to um, uh, ensure that these projects continue. Now, in an environment like this, uh, the Chinese company's approach to trying to get this stability is often relying more closely on the military uh, in order to uh, uh, get further kind of hard security support for projects or to be able to deploy uh, more Chinese security guards on the ground. Now, as the military turns increasingly to the illicit economy to generate revenues, um, you're going to see more of these criminal networks get deeply involved with military actors. That business, that illicit business is going to increasingly replace illicit business and country. And I think you're going to see also a lot of these stakeholders gain more in power and influence in that uh, Myanmar junta that the Chinese companies on the state side are then um, you know, relying on for security for their projects. So I think then you really have uh, kind of a very difficult situation that may or may not be uh, likely is going to be very, I think, increasingly unsustainable, where criminal actors are able to build more and more influence in country through these militia groups uh, and through, um, you know, the fact simply that uh, the Tatmada itself is losing so much in terms of the uh, formal economy. Um, so you've got that sort of trend on, on, on one hand, uh, but then you have another trend where uh, the Chinese state capital and investments are looking desperately for anything that they can do to, to stabilize the, the situation. Um, so I think really looking forward, uh, you know, a lot more thought maybe needs to go into China's post-coup policies. Is it really sustainable for um, China on one hand to uh, continue a lot of these economic um, relationships without really looking at how to uh, resolve the much deeper political issues and much deeper trends, I think, that we're seeing with violence conflict in the country, as well as looking at new ways of trying to address some of the issues that are coming on with um, these illicit capital networks, uh, which are becoming increasingly embedded in the country as well. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, for sharing such a kind of unique angle of uh, um, Chinese investment, especially in the ethnic uh, area and then uh, their relationship with maybe, like you said, the local Kimpen or um, the kind of special interest groups. Um, I will now uh, kind of shift gear a little bit, uh, turn to Lucas, because um, a large portion of the economy is supported uh, through small and medium enterprises. And then, you know, small and medium enterprises and people's livelihoods rely heavily on, you know, job opportunities, um, you know, livelihood, uh, um, sustain a, sust like, subs like basically for investment opportunities that will have to continue to come into the country to kind of sustain, you know, uh, either it's food security, either it's, you know, meal on the table or just, um, you know, like everyday life. Um, so, Lucas, maybe you can share a little bit with us on like how foreign investments view Myanmar as a market and the role of SMEs, uh, either it's from like investors angle or from um, the, the, the host country's angle. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, thanks to having me here. So our first, I would like to say that I'm a, a Chinese citizen, <laughs> and then I'm a lawyer. That uh, my uh, my main job is to uh, help the Chinese Chinese investors and also uh, the investors uh, from other countries to come to invest into Myanmar. So I, I advise them on um, how to do the market entry and how to comply with the legal requirement um, in the receiving country, which is Myanmar. Uh, so I might be a little bit like a, a stakeholder, one of stakeholder here, um, but I would like to address it in an objective way. Uh, okay, so if there's anything that uh, uh, my statement or my uh, my speech is not accurate, please correct me. Okay, so um, I will just uh, uh, share some of uh, my observation here for uh, Chinese investors and also uh, the SME um, uh, from China to invest uh, in Myanmar. So uh, my first observation is um, actually it seems that the Chinese investors actually prefers Myanmar to continue uh, as uh, to continue its democratic transi transition process. It seems that the Chinese investors had greater confidence at each milestone of Myanmar's democratic transition. Based on the investment figures on the foreign investment that published by DICA, we found that the amount of investment from China sharply increased in the Myanmar's financial year of 2011 to 2012 and also in the year 2015 to 2016. In particular, since NLD took power, uh, considerate numbers of BRA projects have uh, been initiated by Chinese government uh, through its SEOEs um, as China-Myanmar economic corridor projects. Um, now we look at the figures, uh, the current figure in uh, for 2020 to 2021, um, which starts from the 1st uh, October 2020. Uh, it shows that uh, China ranks number four in the total investment amount, uh, following UK, Singapore, and Japan. Um, actually, like other, all other uh, foreign investments, China, Chinese firms um, do have been benefited from Myanmar's opening up, growth of domestic market, uh, improvement in business environment, and regulatory. All of these are due to Myanmar's past effort made uh, in its democratic transition. It appears that the uh, um, Chinese investors favor a stable and uh, opened up Myanmar with everything are in the process of improving. And therefore they are more willing to invest in, in a country where it is steadily and uh, smoothly heading to democracy. So my second, uh, my second observation is uh, Chinese investment in Myanmar nowadays are actually in our greater variety. Myanmar's do uh, democratic uh, transition made sensible achievement and has attra attracted a considerable foreign investment with a total amount of more than a US dollar 55 billion in the past 10 years, which is more than 153% uh, of the total amount of the foreign investment made in Myanmar during the past 23 year period from 1988 to 2010. Um, actually, during these uh, past 10 years, a large number of job opportunities are, were created by foreign investment and uh, therefore improved the living uh, standard and life quality of people. Uh, in, uh, among all the Chinese investors uh, coming to, came to Myanmar for investment, I think SMEs and uh, uh, the private enterprise play uh, quite a substantial role, role in, in this period. Um, actually, that there's a lot of uh, shoe making and garment factories established uh, here in Myanmar by Chinese investors. Uh, most of them are actually um, uh, suppliers to uh, some Westerner um, like brands like H&M, like um, Adidas, and uh, um, uh, both the Chinese manufacturers and uh, the local workers actually benefit, benef benefited from uh, the GSP scheme. So in the recent 10 years, um, compared to um, its traditional investment, which were mostly focused on natural resource, not natural resource related sectors, Chinese investment in Myanmar are in a great variety nowadays. So um, now Chinese investment in Myanmar cover a 
a broader spectrum of uh, industry, including oil and gas, power, uh, infrastructure, mining, real estate, banking, automobile, government, shoemaking, tourism, and act. Uh, this, this change is mainly uh, attribute to Myanmar's opening up and the uh, improvement of life, uh, life quality of ordinary Myanmar people, which contribute to the growth of Myanmar domestic market. Uh, my last observation is that the uh, Myanmar's reforms actually are um, made on, uh, there are reforms made on commercial laws um, actually uh, contribute to the uh, improvement of the investment uh, environment, while at the same time uh, uh, require Chinese investors to comply with a more international and higher standard game rules when investing in Myanmar. Um, the last round of uh, Myanmar's reform or commercial law can be traced back to the age of dancing government, which led the um, foundation for Myanmar to be adapted itself to international and modern uh, commercial law framework. Uh, by enacting the Myanmar foreign investment law and uh, um, SEC laws, Myanmar competition laws, and uh, the new Myanmar uh, sorry, the Myanmar uh, company law. Uh, law in 2017 and other laws, bylaws, and notification orders. Um, actually, these such reforms provide uh, with the foreign investor with a leveled playing field uh, for um, in terms of the entry of their business to Myanmar market. And also, it increased the transparency of the investment project by imposing higher standard of uh, requirement on disclosure. Um, imposed uh, and also imposed a mandatory requirement for invest, investment project to go through EIA and SIA procedures. Um, and also um, made the CR, CSR contribution and mandatory requirement. Um, which is specific for Chinese investor is it is um, because it's the law applies to all investors, right? It's also their obligation to comply with uh, such mandatory requirement and it seems to have, uh, they have been quickly adapted to such new game rules uh, quite well. Uh, of course, there are still a lot of to be, are a lot of things to be improved uh, in their investment. Um, and uh, of course, there is a uh, very common in Myanmar to have gaps uh, between legislations and uh, enforcement. Um, I think maybe there are more after maybe uh, should be made um, by Myanmar's law enforcement agency when it comes to inspections and uh, penalties. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much of my observations. Um, sorry, I'm not a scholarship, so I just share my uh, observations and opinions here too. Thanks. Thank you, Lucas. This is super interesting uh, what you just shared because these are really, you know, firsthand experiences and observations that uh, a lot of us, you know, who uh, gather information, do research, you know, online, you know, talking to different, uh, like you said, stakeholders, and then you are really, you know, experiencing, witnessing like the whole process from uh, foreign investors' uh, perspectives. I thought that was just extremely valuable, that thing that you shared. Um, so thank you so much for providing this, uh, just a very relevant um, observations. So uh, that's shift gear, uh, turn to the Q&A session. So um, I'm going to ask uh, maybe a round of questions and then open up uh, to uh, the, the audience. Uh, so uh, first I will uh, go to uh, Ukaiwen. So uh, Ukawa, in your uh, remarks, you talk about um, the, the A-Data uh, article about you know, the hidden debt um, and uh, about the financial exposures that uh, public-private partnerships, PPP, could potentially put countries under. Uh, so can you just share a little bit about the research that you have done on PPP, how is that re relevant to you know, Chinese investment or BRI monitor case studies that we have done? Uh, yes, KB. Actually, in our country, you know, PPP are known mostly as BOT or, or joint venture. And actually, before 2018, PPP regulatory framework in our country was very, very weak. Not very, very, very weak. And maybe uh, we can say that we, we didn't have 
uh, proper PPP law or BPO, uh, BOT law, most of the project, both Western investment and Chinese investment, they were implemented based on unsolicited proposal. That's a problem, uh, bilateral deal, deal making. Now, usually the, the SOE, state-owned SOE, and, and the, all minist you know, the union ministries and the investors, they, they, they make a deal. And then they, they, they implemented the project. Uh, now both uh, Chinese and, and Western investment, they, they, in, the, in the past, they have a lot of governance gaps. And then recently then these governance gaps, gaps were exposed not only in Chinese investment, but also in French total, for example, French total investment pipeline. It's also, total also is the operator of the, of the multiple pipeline project, no? similar, similar to, to uh, uh, BRI and Chinese investment. But uh, actually, uh, as uh, Lucas, I think Lucas mentioned a, a little bit about uh, Chinese uh, investors also, they are they are adapting to the changing political, economic, and governance situation in Myanmar, especially after after 2016 when NLD came to power. So uh, they, they they are they are trying to comply with uh, national law or or or, or national law or or uh, they they are trying to comply with uh, EIA SIA or B 2 B. They are saying that uh, we are we will implement our project uh, based on business to business model, or they are saying that even though even though our our investment our proposals are unsolicited ones, but uh, we will uh, we will conduct this challenge. We will be uh, we will be very transparent, something like that. I think that the, they 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 change their they they are they change their tactics, but the, but uh, because PPP in our country, the government usually, it's also related to government uh, com, uh, investment law uh, because uh, the, the usual, the, in, in energy sector, in extractive sector, and most of the, most of the sector in, in Myanmar, they have to form joint venture with state-owned state -owned companies. So joint venture, and Chinese also, yeah, Chinese investor also, they like to form uh, they call it. Uh, we we can call it SPB, Special Purpose Vehicle, Zhao Q and and also Musa Mandali. So they say that uh, we will, you, know, you, you don't need to worry about uh, debt. So we are we are. This is a private investment. Uh, these are SPB, but they are also implicit you know, government grantees that, that that we need to expose. It's I think it's very important because uh, although we have after 1980. After 1988, I think definitely uh, exactly in no, uh, 2018 November, NED government enacted Project Bank notification. It's uh, actually not law, but it's it, it, this Project Bank notification, uh, the order issued by the president office. It's uh, it's uh, it's a actually, actually regulatory framework for PPB both PPB and and uh, Public public investment project, you know, public investment project, try to try to to strengthen, and the government try actually make efforts to strengthen regulatory framework of PPP and and other other investment project. So and then the the state councilor Dong San Suji also he she chaired the BRA steering committee and she she announced that all the BI project will be. Uh, national priorities, so they they must pass through competitive tendering process, something like that. But uh, there are also issues, especially in my opinion, project financing in our country. Maybe uh, most most of the uh, state owned uh, staff from state owned enterprises, they are government staff. They are they are not expert. They are not they are not finance financial analysts. They are not uh, they are not commercial uh, commercial experts. So that's a problem. I think usually Chinese uh, Chinese investor they invite the state-owned company to 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 uh, to put shares in the in the SPV. But 
uh, in our in our case study also we we found out that actually the Chinese in, investment from the sponsors and then the the, the banks uh, all are state owned banks and and state owned companies and they control the, the whole project life cycle i think that's why the yeah, independent third party assessment is very crucial to successful in, implementation for for mutual beneficial cooperation that's i think very important so we uh, we we are we, we we are suspicious of hidden de hidden debt because we cannot do as you uh, know and then also uh, cgd center for global development also published a, a report huh? no the Ch chinese um, debt 100 100 chinese uh, chinese loan loan in in developing countries so yeah i think the de definitely we have the the, the and the reporting of debt is occurring also occur occur in our in our country yeah. Chinese investment project. So cost we are we are concerned about cost inflation, uh, to, to, because contractor is also contractor and investor project developer they are the same com company. So these are the governance gaps and then PPP PPP, uh, PPP project uh, financing the weakness of uh, PPP uh, project financing. That's we have to be careful and we, can, we have to continue to monitor also the, the environmental issues and then the community, the land, land grabbing issues. These, these issues need to be addressed in, in the future BRM project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ukai Wen. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, you talk about, you know, public private partnership the private part is supposed to be a uh, government leveraging the resources or investment from the true private sector. But in uh, the case of Myanmar, a lot of, uh, you know, PPP project end up, uh, you know, it's state owned enterprises from China uh, forming uh, special purpose vehicles with, um, you know, state owned enterprises in Burma. And then uh, if the special purpose vehicle uh, is default or is insolvent, then the government, because the government provided guarantee to the loan that they undertake, so then the government will be in a financial situation that it kind of wasn't planned to be. Uh, so that way to increase finance, public finance uh, stress. So I thought that was a very interesting um, way to describe um, the pattern of Chinese investment uh, coming into Burma. So uh, next I would like to go to uh, Manilar. Uh, you talk about uh, the military regime has recently green-lighted a lot of um, foreign investment projects. Can you uh, share a little bit on the kind of following the the, 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 the topic on the PPP, because in the past several years, a lot of Chinese like large investments are in the form of PPP. So with uh, all the large projects that the military regime has greenlighted, have you observed any kind of broader trends that um, you would like to share with us uh, after the coup? And what do you think are the, the project that uh, the, the military government will likely to pursue? Uh, for uh, investment, uh, that uh, most of the, the car, uh, current uh, investment we saw Actually, I mean like bigger ones uh, started from NLD government or uh, like Million Jai project in Iavri region. Uh, that project uh, initiated in uh, NLD government for hydropower, a hydropower project, solar panel project. No? And then also the, uh, for example, like uh, Pew Special Economy Zone One, uh, they just resumed. And uh, what we are worried is, like Lucas mentioned, maybe Lucas can also help us that <laughs> for uh, Chinese in, uh, trends, that normally for investment, uh, we can expect like extractive industry, uh, industry type of. Uh, 
uh, projects we can expect because uh, in um, Parken or Mogu or some other areas that it can happen. And uh, for the time being, one thing I want to highlight is that uh, the, uh, 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 even for, uh, there's no uh, rule of law, let's say like that, because uh, even for uh, Myanmar people, that uh, they, if something happened, that there's no, uh, how to call it, police station or courts we can, we can trust to report, or in that type of situation, that it is, uh, risk is so high, so that uh, what I expect is that like Leslie, like uh, extractive industry, and then another one is the dare to do <laughs> type of uh, investors. And in this case, that we cannot expect a kind of a decent type of investment in current situation because uh, you know that corruption is very, very visible nowadays. And then also that a lot of, uh, even for land uh, situation that compensation, uh, the uh, previous government decided to relinquish their ownership, that type of, even for that type of, uh, how to call it land, uh, are taken back. And so that in that type of situation without rule of law that maybe uh, we can expect extractive industry uh, uh, sector. Uh, and then also from, uh, how to call it, nowadays a lot of gambling dance along uh, Thai Burma border. And then but, uh, China uh, Myanmar border is closed recently. So maybe Lucas can add up if I miss something, but this is the trend I, uh, as far as I knew. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manilar. Uh, so next, uh, uh, let me turn to Jason. Uh, Jason talked a lot about um, the situation in like the cross-border area um, in from Yunnan to uh, Myanmar. So uh, Jason, would you please share a little bit on, uh, what do you think, like what are the shifts that you have seen uh, in the China-Myanmar relationship um, following the coup? And how is this likely to impact uh, Chinese in investment in country? Um, because, you know, as Manilar and some of you have pointed out that the general public doesn't have a very favorable view of China. Uh, yeah, no, I guess if I look at the, the, the broader relationship, um, you know, one immediate thing that happened was following the coup, um, the Chinese government essentially put its relationship with the NLD on hold. So, you know, before the coup, there was a very close relationship between the NLD and China. Um, many different types of cooperation on the economic uh, front, political front, social front, lots of party to party exchanges. China was offering training to uh, youth cadres within the NLD. So it's a very robust relationship before the coup. And of course, after the coup, all of that just suddenly uh, came to a very abrupt halt. And it took over two months before any form of dialogue or outreach was resumed with uh, the NLD. Uh, party to party uh, communications finally picked up again a little bit in July. But I think the important thing to recognize is that uh, while China officially has put out this policy now um, that the China Myanmar friendship is open to all people, which I think is a way of trying to signal to the Myanmar public that you know, China is going to engage not only with the military, but it wants to engage with the public as well. I think what's uh, quite clear is that um, China is continuing. I mean, on the economic front, on the diplomatic front, on the political front, uh, to do business with uh, the junta and to provide protection uh, to the junta from, um, you know, the international community and from um, other stakeholders who I think really want to take a much bolder type of, of approach. And there was a good deal of time where China explicitly had, uh, as part of its foreign policy statements, 
a line which essentially stated that China sought to prevent the role of the UN Security Council in uh, Myanmar. So I think that that also gives a sense of how China is very cautious about this being internationalized or uh, you know, other major powers getting involved more, more deeply in the, the Myanmar situation. And it's willing, I think, to expend a little bit of political capital to provide that type of cover to the, the junta. Now, when it comes to the investments, I mean, I, I, I agree that the situation in country is uh, extremely unstable and that this is going to, I think, deter a lot of the uh, more serious Chinese investors, institutional investors. You've seen some companies already, and of course the Ant deal. Um, so uh, Alibaba Ant Finance had been looking at uh, acquiring uh, one of the key payment apps in, in country, and that deal seems to have uh, fallen through. Um, you've seen, I think, other um, major investors uh, show more hesitance in terms of uh, moving ahead with uh, projects. But uh, really, I think a lot of the state-owned enterprises that have existing projects on the ground, it's business as normal. So I mean, down in, in Chopu, uh, China Power actually announced uh, maybe about two months ago that it had completed construction of a major power facility uh, that's going to eventually provide uh, power to the, the Chapu um, uh, port in SEZ. They announced that they completed phase one of the construction a couple of weeks ahead of schedule even. Um, you're seeing other uh, projects uh, like the um, industrial zone in uh, uh, Machina that I think uh, Kokain Wynn mentioned. Uh, there was an MOU that was signed and Myanmar Investment Commission approval was given to that project, kind of giving it a green light to, to move forward. So some of the companies with existing projects are in fact uh, moving ahead. And I guess, again, what I'm uh, fearful of is that you're going to see a lot more of the types of Chinese companies that are attracted to risky environments or attracted to places that have very weak or poor governance. And again, that's a lot of these illicit capital networks and criminal networks that you'll probably see more of those take a greater interest in Myanmar, which is something that I think is very threatening, of course, from the vantage point of the, the Myanmar Mar public and the region more, more broadly. I think also we're seeing signals from Yunnan province, especially from local governments in Yunnan pro province. I mean, Lintang has given over the past month multiple uh, press conferences, including from the Communist Party secretary in that city, talking about picking up the pace of the China-Myanmar economic corridor and moving forward more quickly with some of those investments. And if it's telling at all, I mean, the, um, the, the, the China-Myanmar border trade, uh, border trade fair uh, this year that was held, uh, albeit virtually at the end of August, it had more Chinese companies participate, uh, roughly four times more companies participated on the Chinese side than participated back in, in 2019. Now, the types of companies and whether these are just really focused more on extraction of natural resources, uh, projects that have a very short uh, time horizon, so you know they get in quickly, make money, and go out, I would maybe expect to see a lot more of those sorts of, of projects. I think starting new infrastructure, as I've talked about already, is extremely risky. And it's probably only going to be those major sorts of projects that are having lots of pressure from the Chinese government and Chinese finance to move forward that you'll see kind of continue. I think for some of these new projects like the, the railroad, for example, um, I, I would be surprised if ground suddenly broke on that at this point, given just the, 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 the massive risks in country. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so, Lucas, now uh, a lot of people are kind of like, oh, you know, we will <laughs> defer to Lucas uh, what the China's views are. So obviously, you are just a very invaluable addition to the panel uh, shows, you know, how important China's view is really. Uh, so 
on top of all the other things you have to kind of respond, I would like to ask yeah. one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you just please compare a little bit on the investors' views from China? Like, are there differences or similarities between uh, like institutional mm -hmm. investors versus SMEs or, you know, larger SOEs uh, from China versus just, uh, you know, um, SMEs? Like, so for SOE investors from China, are they mostly like profit driven or, you know, driven by policy priorities? Uh, so any insights you can share on these things? Sure, sure, thanks. So um, for, for this question, um, I think it's um, um, honestly that um, um, it depends. Actually for the uh, private uh, investors that uh, they are mainly profit driven because the, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in the keynote speech is that uh, uh, it, they are benefited from the GSP scheme and they are uh, coming to Myanmar in order to uh, enjoy for this kind of GSP preference, uh, pre pre preference uh, treatment uh, to our manufacturer in Myanmar and export uh, goods from Myanmar to um, other foreign countries in order to make profits. So uh, what they do here is usually uh, garment and shoe making and they hire um, a lot of um, Myanmar local workers and indirectly um, creates uh, the job opportunities. Uh, but also that there are labor issues um, occurred, of course, that the, there are thousands of people in your factories is not easy to uh, manage, manage, have a proper manager. Some of the uh, over investors that actually they, uh, they don't have a very uh, skillful management uh, management approach or um, the measures are not efficient and effective. Uh, for uh, the infrastructure projects, um, are mainly they are mainly conducted by state-owned enterprise, which is SOEs from China. Uh, it is, first of all, it is profit-driven. Um, I will explain why it is profit-driven because I think some, most of people think it is mainly policy-driven something. But uh, there is, uh, there is some, they are actually imp implementing the uh, government policy as well, for sure. Um, but this kind of uh, policy is um, oriented or designed for uh, facilitate uh, the trade and in investment. Uh, of of foreign investment uh, of for, foreign investors here in, in in Myanmar because you you can say that most of the our BRI projects and the uh, CMEC projects that they are are infrastructure they are power plants they are ports they are um, highways and bridges um, and SEZs so actually the reason why um, uh, the uh, the SOEs are echoing for uh, the Chinese government's initiative to uh, conduct the BI projects and CMEC projects is, here is just uh, to uh, increase the connectivity and uh, to uh, implement this kind of a backbone uh, investment projects here to provide basic uh, infrastructures in order to facilitate the, the further, further uh, investment uh, with upgrades and also that uh, uh, to uh, facilitate the trade. Uh, this is the uh, main purpose behind that. Um, so uh, this is the major uh, differences uh, between the um, SOE's investment here and also the private uh, investor uh, coming here uh, for investment. Um, but there's something they share in common, actually is profit driven. Uh, the reason is that the <laughs> businessman, the nature of the business is making money, right? They, they are purchasing, they are, they are pursuing for, Profit. So if your government tell you that uh, go Myanmar, go to Myanmar and invest something, but the, actually it does not make any profit, then uh, no businessman will do it. Actually, it's very, uh, it's very nature. And it's like that. So um, this is the, my, my my thinking about the, the um, whether it's profit driven or it's policy driven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Lucas. Uh, so we got a question from uh, the audience. And because we're kind of short on time, there's so much mm -hmm. to talk about on Burma. Uh, now there's mm -hmm. we're so short on time. So uh, uh, I will just uh, uh, read out the question 
and uh, panelists, uh, feel free to chime in, share um, your thoughts on this, and then we have to uh, conclude today's session. Uh, we can continue our conversation uh, in other ways. Uh, so the question from the audience is, um, could you explain to us further about the impact or influence of Chinese investment on daily politics in Myanmar? especially on the solidity of the top model or military elites. How significant or insignificant is that? Is there a elite conflict because of the political economic cleavages within the top model caused by the Chinese investment? Um, Jason, you want to start? Yeah, I, I can throw out a couple of thoughts. I mean, I think in, in my view, uh, it's much more likely that you'll be seeing um, kind of tensions flare up around Chinese investments, um, not within the Tatmada necessarily, but I think a lot more will be created between ethnic armed organizations in the Tatmada or even amongst rival ethnic armed organizations over some of the projects. And that's definitely something that we've seen. I mean, we've seen uh, dam projects in Northern Myanmar become a flashpoint because large scale centralized dam conflicts placed um, in uh, areas um, where ethnic armed organizations, um, you know, are more or less the authorities in those areas are a major threat. Uh, as soon as the Tatmadaw starts placing those dam projects in there, the next thing they wanna do is send troops in for security. And then immediately you're gonna see conflict break out because that threatens the autonomy and the ability of those ethnic armed organizations to uh, maintain control and influence in their areas. So that I think is a flashpoint that you'll continue to see. And as you know, Chinese companies continue investing in the post-coup environment, you'll maybe see more of those flashpoints. I think right now, the one to look at most is Rakhine State, where the Arakan army is of course um, consolidating a lot of its uh, uh, administrative authorities in, in Rakhine, and that's creating tensions already. Uh, but at the same time, the junta is moving ahead rapidly with Chapu and with other projects. And at some point, as those projects move forward, I think there is going to be increasing perceptions from the public. Well, you know, what are the revenues that are coming to the Arakan army from these projects? And that I think could be another flashpoint or, or, or cause of tensions. And then again, I think we've already talked a little bit about how uh, the population views some of these investments and how these investments are all, all often becoming ensnared in or uh, engulfed in the conflict between uh, the people and uh, the military. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we're at time. So I would encourage all the audience uh, to keep following the BRI monitor projects. And if you wanted to reach out to any of the panelists today uh, to have you know, continuous conversation on the issues we've touched on, there are a variety of them today, uh, you know, just on like Chinese uh, investment into Myanmar, Burma, and Chinese investment into the region in general. So uh, I will encourage you to uh, send email to us and then we will connect you with any of the panelists um, and I'm sure we will have um, more conversation on this uh, topic uh, in the next um, uh, few weeks and months uh, as Chinese investment is going to continue to play a very, very critical role in the region. Uh, so I thank you all so much for joining us today. A special thanks to all the panelists um, for sharing your experiences, expertise, and you know analysis. These are just incredible um, insights that we benefit so much from today. So thank you all so much and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.